Assessment Fellow. So Dr. Ashmita Sen Gupta, I'd like to invite you on stage. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Namaskar, uh, Assalamu Alaikum. It's lovely to be here with you today, and uh, I extend my warm welcome to whoever is with us for this re for this particular session on reimagining education for the next generation environment leaders. I have the privilege to be sharing this stage today with some really distinguished and highly accomplished panelists. So first off. I would request you to join me in welcoming them on stage. So Dr. Mehbooba Nasreen, might I please have the honor of having you on stage. So as she walks up, I should let you know that uh, Dr. Mehbooba Nasreen is the professor at the Dhaka University, pro vice chancellor at the Bangladesh Open University, and the founding director of the Institute of Disaster Management and Vulnerability Studies at the University of Dhaka. She is also the regional head of GRIP South Asia, and GRIP, I would like to mention, stands for Gender Responsive Resilience and Intersectionality in Policy and Practice. As a member of the National Disaster Management Advisory Committee, the Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief, and the Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, Professor Nasreen has contributed to policy making in reducing disaster risks and other relevant areas of national and international importance. Next, Ms. Rita Banerjee, if I might have the honor of having you on stage. Ms. Rita Banerjee is the founder director of Green Hub, a Northeast network Dusty Foot Initiative India that looks at leveraging the power of youth in conservation action and social change through the power of the visual media. She has been one of the leading environment filmmakers in India, having made multiple award-winning films under Dusty Foot Productions. This includes the Wild Meat Trail that won the Panda Award, also known as the Green Oscar, in 2010 at Wild Screen UK. In 2017, she was awarded the National Geographic CMS Prithvi Ratna Award for contribution to the environment through films and the RBS Earth Heroes Award in 2018. She was inducted as an Ashoka Fellow in 2019. Finally, Dr. Narayan Sharma, might I please have you on stage? Dr. Narayan Sharma is an assistant professor at the Department of Environmental Biology and Wildlife Sciences, Cotton University, Guwahati, Assam, India, and an adjunct professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore, Karnataka. An educationist, conservation biologist, and ecologist, Dr. Sharma has two decades worth of experience working in the field of education and wildlife research in Northeast India. He is a member of the Assam State Biodiversity Board and a nominated member of the IUCN Primate Specialist Group, South Asia. There was a very lukewarm response for some reason. Might I please? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to join you here so that we can have a real conversation. So uh, Naranda, I'm going to start with you. So you have a faculty position at uh, what is possibly one of the oldest academic institutions in the greater Eastern Himalayan region, right? So what do you think are the unique opportunities that the region offers for the next generation environment leaders? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Asmita. Uh, yeah, you are right. Uh, Cotton University is one of the oldest uh, institutions. It was established in 1901, so almost 121 years old. Uh, when I joined in 2015, uh, the Cotton University didn't have uh, the a dedicated uh, department uh, for wildlife research or environmental research. So though it was a kind of a fringe subject which was there in uh, geology and uh, botany department, and thanks to Professor Durba uh, Soikia, who was then vice chancellor, who established this de department and gave, gave us opportunity to start a new uh, course. Uh, so initially it was mostly the uh, PG course, still still the uh, majority of uh, our time is going to train the PG postgraduate students. Uh, uh, when we jo joined this, uh, and the biggest challenge is to set, set a, uh, a curriculum uh, which, which should be uh, region specific. And, uh, uh, and also to bring the subject from fringe to the mainstream, because otherwise there was a conventional uh, say subject like uh, physics or chemistry, geology, and the botany, 
uh, they were dominated in, in, the, in the natural science uh, stream and the other subjects. So the biggest challenge was to uh, tell people that the environmental science is just not for uh, sake of uh, studying it, you know, like uh, UGC University, University Grant Commission has made it mandatory to uh, undergraduate students to uh, opt for this EVS uh, course, mm -hmm. which was earlier taught by some other departments. So, uh, so the biggest challenge was uh, first is to design a curriculum that uh, encompasses the uh, different aspect of, uh, say, uh, wildlife re uh, um, wildlife and ecology and biodiversity aspect into this. And second was uh, the lack of uh, trained teachers. So I, uh, when we joined, uh, so I was the only person from the wildlife uh, background. So I still am, after seven years, still a single faculty of the wildlife uh, <laughs> department. Uh, but uh, I, I really uh, took this as, a, as an opportunity uh, as well as the challenge mm -hmm. to, to do this. And thanks to the technology, while sitting in Guwahati, I can invite uh, faculties from Bangalore, faculties from uh, Delhi, faculty from WII, or even faculty from abroad to take, take classes. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really uh, like a, a gave an opportunity for my students to get exposure. So, uh, so one of my students used to say that, sir, you you uh, you gave us buffet, you know, like a, uh, so if continental, Mediterranean, and whatever dishes you uh, we want, you gave us, and it was if we do not able to absorb, it's our fault, not not your fault. Mm -hmm. But uh, the 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 that was the biggest challenge, and uh, thankfully after uh, so right now currently this is the seventh batch that I'm teaching as a uh, seventh and sixth batch, five fifth batch already uh, passed out. So till now, 111 students have uh, enrolled for these uh, courses. And if, if you uh, look at the gender also, so 50% uh, uh, and the uh, boys and almost 60% uh, girls. So uh, students were there. And uh, so it, gender wise also more girls student opted for this mm -hmm. uh, courses uh, course and reason wise we still lagging behind because almost more than 95% students come from only from the Brahmapra Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a little bit uh, uh, worrying and none of the uh, only three students from other states of Northeast India. So mm -hmm. we really need to uh, say have more representative in, in our course. Mm -hmm. So so these are the some of the Challenges and challenges, I think, uh, uh, now after seven years, so I must say that uh, we have reached in a, in a position where uh, you can love uh, us, you can hate us, but you cannot ignore us. So that department is in, in that stage now. Yeah. yeah. So as you may have uh, realized, Rita, that I asked him about the opportunities, but he spoke about the challenges. So I'll have to do a flip and ask you about the opportunities because you are the one who mobilizes youth in that region uh, towards social action and towards uh, environment conservation. So what do you think are the unique opportunities that the region offers for uh, the next generation environment leaders? Yeah. Well, thank you, Asmita, for having us here. Um, I think it's also Im uh, important to talk of the challenges in some other ways uh, mm -hmm. because my work emerges from there. So um, uh, if we really look at, since we are talking about education and mm -hmm. the education system, I think something which really um, goes missing is that the entire design of education right from schools to colleges, I think nothing is there which binds you to your roots. Mm -hmm. There's nothing which binds you to your land, your forest, and your rivers. Mm -hmm. In fact, everything in education takes you away from your land. Right. You know, the aspirations are again linked to the urban, uh, urban life. Mm -hmm. They're linked to this paradigm of development which feeds into the city. Right. So, at the same time, there is no respect for, you may know how to grow your own forest, you may know how to grow your own food, you know how to build your own house, but that is not assigned as knowledge. Right. And then you move away from that, and suddenly you feel that you are you're not, uh, you, you need more education. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the biggest gap where education is concerned. Okay. And that carries on even later, if you look at the skill development program, which again is feeding into another system. Mm -hmm. It doesn't teach you to go back to your land or to say that, okay, I have 
can generate income out of my natural resources. It is not telling you that. Even the skill development programs are feeding into uh, urban life. You're being taught hospitality management. You're being taught how to drive a car. You're being taught how to feed into the electricity thing. I'm not saying those jobs are not good. They mm -hmm. are important. Yeah. But at the same time, when you're talking about rural youth or community youth who are living with the forest and the natural resources, you're not teaching them that you can go back. Yeah. And there's a, there's a possible life by mm -hmm. using that. Yeah. forming collectives, forming enterprises around that. So I think our work emerged from that gap. Mm -hmm. You know, so what we've done is kind of, we've, we started about eight years back. It's, a, it's called the Green Hub Fellowship. Mm -hmm. It's for youth from marginalized communities, remote areas, indigenous communities. Uh, you may be somebody who hasn't even been to a school. Um, they're all uh, at a stage, at a very important stage, uh, around the age of 19, 20, to even 30, 40 years old. And uh, uh, what we do is, since I'm a filmmaker, uh, for me, video has been my most uh, learning tool about conservation. Everything I've learned about conservation is through that tool. So we are using video as a transformative tool. How do you really change that mindset? Mm -hmm. So the fellows live with us for a one year. They use video as a tool to learn about what is happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're learning about human-animal conflict, they're learning about restoration, they're learning about uh, women's empowerment, but through the use of the video. So while these stories are getting made, what is happening actually is a mindset shift. Right. Okay, and that's that's what we are, we are building towards. So when you're talking about a challenge, I think the biggest challenge is whatever we do in conservation, it needs people. Mm -hmm. We may do innovations, we may have technology. At the end of it, we need people with that. You need to scale up that thought process. Mm -hmm. You know, and how do you scale up that thought process? You need a forest of people. Yeah. So I think that is the, I think that is what we are all working towards. And I think if we can tackle that challenge mm -hmm. where the thought process of conservation becomes systemic, I think that that's the beginning you can say, you know? Yeah. Thanks, Rita. Very interesting insights indeed. And I'm definitely going to get back to the use of video as a tool for changing mindsets as well. But for now, uh, Professor Nasreen, we are talking about the Greater Eastern Himalayan region. And we know that Bangladesh lies to the south of the, I would say, the foothills of the Eastern Himalayas. So do you think you have similar opportunities and challenges, especially I uh, kind of uh, resonated with the bit on how our aspirations, our educational aspirations, are often disconnected uh, from the place that we belong to. So do you, do you face similar issues in Bangladesh as well? Uh, similar, in fact, because uh, I'm just listening to all of you and also to the previous session. Yes. I have been listening to them. Uh, because education is the first uh, goal of an individual's life be it from family, mm -hmm. from educational institutions, and from your environment. So I can share my personal experience because you know that within the South Asian region, Bangladesh is a disaster-prone mm -hmm. country, geographical location. We are very much vulnerable, three major rivers confluencing within Bangladesh. So what we found when there were, like I was a student of university in 1987 and 88, two consecutive floods happened. And we don't know that how do people cope mm -hmm. and why these kind of floods are happening because this is not in our curriculum. Mm -hmm. This may be in the engineering solution or structural uh, solutions were there. So when we heard first that what are the causes of this kind of uh, disasters in Bangladesh, uh, what's happening? We heard for the first time the word deforestation. Mm -hmm. We heard the word the global warming. Yeah. Then what happened that I got a scholarship to study overseas. Then we found we don't know anything about how I get to apply there. Mm -hmm. So then um, we are, I mean, at, at the time was in the Department of Sociology because this is a social issue, mm -hmm. but everyone is thinking of it as a like 
natural, natural science issues. Yeah. So natural. So which is not the fact. So then it was very much um, not in our curriculum that Rita mentioned, mm -hmm. and not even any other departments that much taught. So that's why um, it, it was a challenge for me. Yeah. And I studied disasters and I had to do courses mm -hmm. in overseas uh, environment. Uh, natural hazards and research methodology because I don't know how to apply this. So this is just a personal experience in the uh, early 90s. Right. Uh, then uh, gradually we had uh, youth for and also some environmental movements mm -hmm. on those issues because we have to know that why these are happening. Yeah. So that's how the curriculum gradually have the sociology of environment we developed. We have developed when coming back the uh, sociology of disasters and all other disciplines gradually emerge in the policy making level. That mm -hmm. how we have involved in the policy making level. Yeah. We are involved because we are invited by the government. When they have been getting projects, they didn't have any academics mm -hmm. or not even practitioners. So we will be dealing with this um, like training of trainers and who will be talking about these experts, these areas of specialization. That's how gradually we became involved mm -hmm. and we find a lot of curriculum module gaps and also uh, specifically the experts, the mm -hmm. resource persons mm -hmm. who will be telling you and uh, uh, giving the knowledge, inducing the knowledge to youths. Mm -hmm. So then from the tertiary level, it is other way around. Right. The environmental issues went to the curriculum, primary, secondary. And luckily I was involved in all those because there are only few people who have been working on those environmental issues and those who have been uh, involved in these uh, having degrees, overseas mm -hmm. degrees and also having students. So gradually we are successful to provide uh, training of trainers to the professionals who will be working in the field of environment mm -hmm. and on the disaster management issues and not taking disaster as a natural phenomena, but thinking of it as, as a human induced too, yeah. and which we have to have disaster risk reduction. So the education system also had to be changed for next generation because now we have youth um, like uh, voices, who have been working on like we have in our institute having uh, saying that we are going to home during holiday and planting trees. Oh. Go home and plant trees. So this kind of slogans and everything is coming from the uh, academic as well as the practitioners as, as well as from the um, youth who have been working in many forums. Mm -hmm. So that's how uh, these we what I found it's a challenge mm -hmm. and we have to blame ourselves like uh, the panelists already they have mentioned that we have to change our views mm -hmm. like our paradigm shift yeah. uh, that should be shifted mm -hmm. because how do we change like in the gender responsive resilience mm -hmm. and policy and practices we are doing my action mm -hmm. through involving youth mm -hmm. and we are giving how to disseminate the signal for cyclones mm -hmm. to the people who do not understand this standardized Bangla or English. Okay. We are doing some storytelling within South Asian for these intersectional communities. So then we are going to this inclusive and mm -hmm. intersectionality approaches mm -hmm. through uh, the different, uh, not only through the curriculum, but also the practical uh, so, lessons. Yes. Sounds Thank really uh, inspiring. It, it is inspiring what you're doing. So I suppose there are challenges, but also we have recognized that there are ways to overcome those challenges. It's definitely going to be difficult, but perhaps we have somehow either figured out or will figure out in a while as to how to overcome those. So you were talking about the change of mindsets and you did too. So uh, Naranda, you are an academic, and you said in your CV that you are passionate about nurturing young minds towards wildlife conservation in the new generation. So conservation uh, in general is a huge discourse within the environment education field, right? And uh, yet uh, conservation education by definition is basically 
you know, the process of making people rethink their ideas about wildlife and their habitats. Yet, when it comes to conservation education in practice, we are constantly giving these, I mean, I, I myself included, I suppose, giving our students these discourses about how there are ecosystem services and there are nature's contributions to people, which is why nature needs to be saved or the ecosystem needs to be saved. But do you think you would ever think of restructuring this particular curriculum such that we lay emphasis on nature for its own sake, the intrinsic value of nature, any life has the right to, to survive. So do you think we can ever have a discourse around that? Uh, I think, yeah, we are doing that actually. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I really wanted to emphasize, we're talking about uh, all these two day, days, we're talking only about rewilding nature, right? Mm -hmm. I think we should we should move beyond this. I think uh, as an academicians, mm -hmm. I think we should also uh, do something called the rewilding mind and hearts. Yes. I think uh, what what I felt uh, during my tenure of this say, say six seven years that we are kind of a urban students are kind of a disconnected with nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and first of all, if you, if you uh, uh, George Monbiot, I think uh, very rightly said that unless you uh, you you are not involved. Mm -hmm. in in things you'll never going to save them yeah so i think the first thing uh, that's why the, if you look at the curriculum curriculum of this uh, post graduate the first thing that that we introduce is the natural history mm -hmm. i think perhaps this is the uh, this uh, i'm not sure but uh, this is uh, perhaps the only course that has this art and science of natural history mm -hmm. the first uh, unit that uh, the students are taught is not uh, wildlife conservation, not the complexity of uh, political ecology, not uh, anything else, but first the art and science of natural history. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? So it, it's not a, uh, say, only about science, it's not, not only about uh, naming species. So, so I'll just give you an example. So I give one exercise, I divide the students into two groups and ask them to go in one side and uh, note down all the uh, trees, not mm -hmm. the name. Mm -hmm. They can give any name and the other group will go to other side and they, they can name it. And then they exchange notes. Then the other group, uh, the each group has to go and find the uh, what uh, the tree that particular person has done it. So, you know, like uh, then we, we are nowhere, no taxonomy, nothing like this, just their perception, the illustrations. So we need to involve people. You know, we need to involve the student from the beginning. So not bombarded them with uh, with the very gory figures initially. For first, I think uh, so. One challenge is that I always face is when I get students at the PG level. So they have uh, a very half baked uh, understanding of nature, and in the de degree and in the uh, school also they were taught about uh, something which was which is not uh, exactly true. So you know, like and then it become the de-learning process, mm -hmm. then relearning. Yeah. Right. So that I do. And the first entire semester and second semester dedicated only to understanding the nature mm -hmm. for its own sake. Then from third stage, the say third semester, then they will learn the conservation biology mm -hmm. and fourth semester, they will learn about the human uh, society and ecology. So it, we have structured that syllabus in such a way that the students exposed to natural uh, history first. They will understand even even uh, I think these are the students that comes. Uh, uh, I, I must uh, admit that uh, most of this come because of the love of wildlife, mm -hmm. you know, not because of, say, to solve some bigger environmental problem. So they just they, when the in the freshers, when you ask them, so why you uh, why you choose this course? They said we really love the nature. Mm -hmm. So I think the in, initial motivation of joining this course is uh, the intrinsic value. Then suddenly we introduce complexities, saying that this is uh, this is what uh, it happened. At the end, we sent a very confused person, you know, uh, with. Uh, <laughs> coming with a very nice story about the nature and going uh, with a very uh, kind of a uh, not demotivated, but I think the, the realities. I was going to say many yeah. lines of our code. Exactly. <laughs> so that the reality they go. And then uh, one important thing that I uh, al al always tell them that don't uh, be very, very critical in, in your thinking. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, when when you are thinking about certain things, don't take it on on the face value. Evaluate yourself. Do not uh, ape what uh, say 
uh, other scientists are doing or other reasons are doing. So, so your reason is very, very, very uh, specific, unique reason. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand the problems of your places. So I think that give also the kind of ownership uh, in, in, in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's how we do it. And, and plus, uh, we regularly do this bird watching session, then uh, tree watching sessions, then spider watching sessions. So one of my students has done work on the spider, which in, in Guwahati, mm -hmm. uh, the another is working on, say, uh, plant uh, street trees in Guwahati. So, uh, so we do not have to go to say some very exotic uh, or say very fancy looking national park or wildlife sanctuary. The nature is there in Guwahati city. So, so that's how. Uh, and in fact, within the campus, uh, we have uh, done this bird watching session for the last seven years. So we have a seven year data of birds mm -hmm. from the campus. And we are doing phenology observations of uh, selected trees in the campus. So that that is also giving us uh, idea about uh, what, what what is changing, the, the, mm -hmm. how the phenology is changing. So because if, if you have to say climate change is happening, we need data, right? So mm -hmm. we are also generating data in, in that way by involving students in each semester. Very nice. Yeah. I was thinking about your uh, exercise and I was telling myself what's in a name, the taxonomy exercise that anybody can name anything, anything for that matter. So Rita, coming back to you, because there are three academics on the panel and you are the only interesting one. So... <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah. You guys are out. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you about, so you were talking about how you learned all about conservation thanks to what you do. And uh, so what is your, what is your take on using again videos as a tool to make people or other environment generations, the next, next generation environment leaders, I beg your pardon, appreciate the intrinsic value of nature more, you know, the urge to protect nature simply because it exists, simply because it's beautiful. So I think it's not such a simple answer because I think our entire design of the fellowship was driven by the fact that, yes, conservation is the final goal. Mm -hmm. uh, but to reach that, to think that people will protect us just for the sake of nature is not such a simple thought. Mm -hmm. uh, especially because all the fellows we are working with uh, come from rural communities, they mm -hmm. come from indigenous communities, livelihood or income generation, mm -hmm. whichever way you want to put it, is an important factor. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why you have so much of migration. Yeah. You know, there are many of them, I mean, many youth from the Northeast mm -hmm. are working in other parts of India. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that only maybe 10% of them make it into really good jobs, mm -hmm. most of them come back. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, when you're talking about that group of youth, then uh, while one is working towards conservation, the path has to be a combination of both. You're looking at nature, but how do you look at nature-linked livelihood? Mm -hmm. So we were looking, for us, video is a tool. Mm -hmm. We're not making, the idea is, the outcome is not that, uh, you know, that we want hundreds of filmmakers. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is, how do you use video as, as a transformation of the mind? So we've had very beautiful stories, like many of these youth from the Northeast, hunting is part and parcel of their life. They've mm -hmm. grown up hunting, yeah. you know, so, but what happens is when you come and camera is a very beautiful tool, you know, so you're using the camera to get a close up of an insect, you're using the camera to get a close up of a bird, mm -hmm. you know, and suddenly instead of using a gun, you're using a camera. And what happens is you come back and we're looking at the footage because we have the editing set up mm -hmm. there. So all these guys are coming with their footage. You're looking at the footage, you're identifying the uh, thing. And what happens is suddenly there are 20 more people and saying, wow, what a good shot. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's yeah. a spark. You know, so from we've had, I think every batch we have people from the forest patrolling staff or this boy, Thang Soi, who's part of this current batch. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you see the photographs he's shown you, he's come back with a picture of him. It's like a group photo with macaques, all dead macaques next to him, which he's oh, hunted. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, during the fellowship, he suddenly looks at it and he says, I did not realize that this is an endangered species or this is a, it's in my forest. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then by the time the fellowship is ending, he's saying, ma'am, how do I do this? I want to stop hunting in my village. Now... That is what we catch on to, mm -hmm. that first thought. Yeah. And then that's the conversation where it begins. And from that stopping hunting, what is the, because that's, that's, the, that's the most difficult part. Mm -hmm. But after that, that process takes a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. So going back to the village, 
again, the film becomes a very good tool for community dialogue. Mm -hmm. So he shows the film to his village. This is our forest. This is what we have in the thing. And from there, the livelihood mm -hmm. thing starts happening. Mm -hmm. Whether it's through uh, tourism, whether it's through sustainable forms of agriculture, whether it's through research, they're different forms, mm -hmm. you know? So that's what's been happening over the years. So our conversations with the fellows are very layered and it takes years. Yeah. I mean, they join for a year, but then once a fellow, you're always a fellow. So uh, even Anoko, who's, who won the award, on the, he's, a, he's from our first batch. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came, he's been using the camera, but today he's working with his community to protect the land, get the forest back. You know, so out of all the of almost 90% of the fellows, they're still working with conservation after mm -hmm. eight years, mm -hmm. either in the form of films, either by working with their own community. So camera becomes like a, you know, video is a very, very beautiful tool to make that happen. Yeah. But we cannot disengage it from the real issues on the ground of livelihood and all. Yeah. So that becomes the starting point. But what makes us makes things happen on the ground is mm -hmm. the constant engagement post yeah. that yeah and that's where a lot of collaborations is mm -hmm. where it helps yeah like we are not experts in restoration but mm -hmm. we have a whole network of people mm -hmm. who are experts at restoration yeah. so those guys are then helping a guy like one Mai who's working in a remote area trying to get the forest back you know mm -hmm. and he's i mean it's like a co-learning space mm -hmm. he's been bringing in his traditional knowledge mm -hmm. and there's a group from ncf which is helping him to work out what should be the practice yeah. what is good so it's it's a very it, it's like every every line of conservation which is emerging from these youth mm -hmm. whether it's to do with education restoration tourism mm -hmm. has to be worked with in collaboration with a lot of people yeah. so that's the beautiful part of it also but i cannot say that uh, just for the heck of nature but at this stage completely I, it, hopefully yeah. it'll become like that but I yeah. think that very transition from somebody who is happily killing macaques to somebody appreciating macaques for their own sake, that itself is a huge jump that's and that is quite an achievement really. No, and that's the inspiration from the youth. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, if they talked about the fellowship before this, which is fantastic uh -huh. because yeah. the youth, their minds are fantastic, right. you know, so that will, that's like a lead we have to all take into. Yeah, I do feel that uh, the fellowship was, I mean, the fellowship uh, panel was kind of a nice segue into our panel discussion as well. So uh, she was, uh, Rita was talking about indigenous communities and I know that you have engaged a lot with indigenous communities. I was in fact very intrigued by your doctoral research title, which said, uh, which was basically on coping with floods and it was very specifically the experiences of rural women in Bangladesh. So very quickly, because I unfortunately we are running out of time. How important do you think it would be to highlight the importance of gender equity in formal environmental education? And also, how do you think we could reconcile indigenous knowledge with, again, conventional environmental education? Uh, thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, as has been uh, mentioned by Narayan and Rita, I'm referring always to them because it's very close that we are working. First of all, the word conservation. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any conservation strategy. Mm -hmm. Even within South Asia, we must have because we share so many things. Yeah. But we don't have that common conservation strategy. So Bangladesh, after a long time, developed a conservation strategy. And they didn't get anything uh, on the gender issues in the conservation mm -hmm. strategy. But because we, I had the, at that time I was involved in my research, I mentioned that I mm -hmm. didn't know that what would be the theory, the coping strategies. Mm -hmm. So then it was the grounded theory. So mm -hmm. I have collected facts from the field. Then the theory emerged that we should not see any community like those who are thinking of vulnerable. Mm -hmm. In fact, they are the major contributors mm -hmm. in the environmental management, coping and adaptation. And that was the theory mm -hmm. which is going on through the academic curriculum as well as the adaptation practices. You, mm -hmm. you see the environmental education also giving us these spaces and it is the theory is now well established and we are applying this in the environmental protection mm -hmm. at the same time applying in the national adaptation and resilience yeah. also mm -hmm. so that's how i think that someone has to start or some people have to start then it will continue mm -hmm. through the dissemination and yeah. involving youth because as you see that 
uh, intersectionality uh, is also bringing about the persons with disability. Mm -hmm. And also we are working with the indigenous communities. I had one student and then large number of students uh, mm -hmm. started to do that. Uh, the ethnobotanic practices mm -hmm. of indigenous community. Yeah. And what interestingly we found that the age, there is age barriers, uh, age gap, the no knowledge on the trees, mm. who is like above 80, 70 or below 60, they are giving long list of trees that they know mm -hmm. uh, involved in their everyday lives. Yeah. But gradually the young generation, they don't know where the mm -hmm. tree, how do they look like. And that the tradition, that ethnobotanic practices of the indigenous community, we are thinking of invi inviting people like the botanist and other people also working mm. on that. Yeah. That we didn't even know that who are the aggressive species, mm -hmm. but now we know that yeah. that those are listed. Mm -hmm. So that's how I think that the uh, we are go doing good mm -hmm. at this stage. Yeah. specifically when thinking of leaving no one behind or thinking mm -hmm. of intersectional community. There are so many communities and all women are not the same. Of course. So these strata, that highly stratified society, we are also thinking of that. So now the time is that we have already destroyed mm -hmm. many things. Yeah. So now we cannot find those environment back, mm -hmm. but what can we do? the young generation, they can rebuild or re, um, like unite all those species that we lost yeah. already. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to quickly say that this um, extremely bad resolution photo is actually that of a wonderful painting by a Russian artist called Nicholas Rurik, who spent the last 20 years of his life just painting the Himalayas at different times of the day from different angles, which is to say that even if we spend a part of our lifetimes with the Himalayas, we are still going to, you know, uh, discover new facets of it every single day. So we are leaving this extremely important asset in the hands of the next environment, next generation of environment leaders. And I hope they will be engaging with some of the strands that came out in our conversation today about the importance of looking at intrinsic value, how mindset change is probably the most important thing that can happen in this respect engaging with indigenous communities, engaging with, uh, of course, uh, I mean, talking about gender equity. And talking of gender equity, by the way, can we please have a round of applause just for the fact that there are three women on the panel. <laughs> so that's very rare, even in this day and age. Yeah, so we seem to have taken a right step in that direction. Very, very quickly, but I cannot let go of you without asking you this particular question. We have shared histories, shared geographies, shared cultures and shared environmental problems. I think people in Kolkata and Dhaka were reeling under the soaring temperatures this summer. And uh, we have been talking about what Bangladesh has been doing, and we've been talking about what the India government has been doing. But, uh, you know, just the four of us, or whoever is in this room right now, what do you think of a forum wherein Bangladesh and India, I'm not talking about governments, policymakers, whoever, Narayanda from India, and Professor Nasreen from Bangladesh, you can exchange ideas about how to tackle these issues going forward. So very quickly, but each one of you. So I'll start with Narayanda. I think uh, we have been doing this. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, before joining Cotton. I was I'm still a primatologist, so the, uh, the uh, we both shared primates, right? Uh, yeah. The stumptail macaque, hula gibbons, pigtail macaques, fairies leaf monkey. So there is enough scope, though it's a it's a politically uh, it's a divided, but I think ecologically united, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I think uh, since uh, uh, since we are so ecologically united, I think there is there are a lot of opportunity for students to in fact uh, come and also take this mm -hmm. course that that we are offering. Yeah. That is, and also because this course is very unique in 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 the in the sense that there are other courses which are in the central uh, India and the South India, and this mm -hmm. is perhaps one of the co unique course which is there in the northeastern India. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we can exchange ideas and we can exchange students also. Yes. And we can, uh, it's uh, its not very far. We can also like uh, if somebody is working in Hula Gibbon in Bangladesh and in uh, in uh, northeastern India, we can mm -hmm. we can share our, our research in, yeah. in, in, in a common way. 
right yeah. so i think there are a lot of scope for that that, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff and uh, uh, certainly yeah uh, so uh, there, there could be a forum the, mm-hmm. since i'm a, i'm a primatology i'm, I'm interacting with the primate primates mm-hmm. already uh, people yeah. people who are working on primates who are primates sense. also people yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so there are there are a lot of uh, yeah. opportunities yeah. here professor nasreen yes i am saying about uh, already established network we have a gender and disaster network mm-hmm. and it is bangladesh hub and we are thinking of taking it india because we are developing curriculum together mm-hmm. with another university jamshed ji tata university and bangladesh on intersectionality mm-hmm. so we have two, two platforms at this moment mm-hmm. one is that grip pl- platform and gender and disaster network at our institute so i'm inviting all of you to become member and we do research exchange and curriculum very promising Thank indeed you. rita using the video to bring bangladesh and <laughs> india together yeah <laughs> yeah i think uh, what, what's really is uh, when we are talking about borders it's not just intra across countries but uh, if you look at the northeast and india we have the state yeah. borders and there are so many conflicts between borders state mm-hmm. borders itself so what has really worked for us is that uh, the network of fellows what it does is it really transcends barriers of identity transcends barriers of boundaries mm-hmm. so i think uh, to really build a very strong network of youth uh, across bangladesh india and exchange ideas mm-hmm. really connect the youth who are working with various forms of conservation and social change mm-hmm. and uh, youth across india who are working with conservation that's yeah. a huge network mm-hmm. and i think uh, that network of friendship is what i think can be a very very powerful a web of action <laughs> i think for the future yeah. you know that's amazing and it's amazing that both of you were talking about youth and exchange programs as well because i think that would be a perfect opportunity for you to for me to invite professor bava on stage to make just me okay i mean he's had enough of the limelight i suppose so yeah he wants me to be uh, hogging the spotlight so uh, so in partnership with uh, the balipara foundation atri which is the institution that i am affiliated with and professor bava is the founder president of is announcing two scholarships for masters and phd programs in india in bangalore mainly and uh, this particular course the masters course is in conservation practice and we are particularly keen upon welcoming south asian students and especially bangladeshi students i have to say so please check out our flyers outside or for that matter we have also put together some slides please take a look and you can always drop a mail to any of us at any point of time i would like to thank all my panelists balipara foundation for giving us this opportunity to co-organize this discussion all of you for being here and everyone in bangladesh for the warm welcome that they have given us which has made this trip truly worthwhile thank you <laughs>